So let's, let's get down to it. Lucifer, his biography is in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. These four horsemen his, his, are representative of his real alien invaders. Demons are the real alien invaders of Revelation chapter 9. And John introduces us to the dreadful realm of fallen spirits and where they live, the abyss. And it's awful. It's enough to, to you know, keep you awake at night if you didn't know that you had the protection of the Spirit of God. So number one, God's super angels are the most powerful creatures in the universe. That's why when we see them in chapter 9, uh, this, this star falling from heaven, this is one of God's super angels, they're amazing. But God has a maximum security cosmic being real alien prison. You know, they're not in Area 51, don't worry about it. You know, like uh, Independence Day movie was about, that they had these things that were like demons there. No, no. These things are in God's prison. No one gets out of it until he lets them. And Satan is most likely the star God allows to open the pit. And this abyss is mentioned seven times. Look there. 9-1, 9-2, 9-11, 11-7, 17-18, and 21 and 23. The seven times, this, this abusas is the Greek word. And this abyss is the prison for the worst demonic creatures. Jesus talked about it in Luke 8.31. Remember when the, the angel or the demon said, don't send us to the, the abyss, we don't want to go there. That's, you can't get out. They like to roam. 2 Peter 2 talks about them, verse 4. Jude talks about them. Uh, these are angels that are so lethal, so vile, so malignant, that if they're let out, they would destroy everything. And so God keeps them incarcerated. So the whole topic, this is angelology in, in systematic theology. Systematic theology has many different divisions. Uh, these are the most powerful creatures in the universe. Stronger than the Eternals, stronger than the Avengers, stronger than, you know, all those are false. These are real. And these are the ones God talks about. Where did they come from? Well, the doctrine of the creation of angels, and, you know, I'm slipping a little bit forward to help you understand to chapter 12, explains how Satan... Uh, took a third of the heavenly hosts. So here's what happened. God created all angels. Two-thirds remain with God and serve him. One-third rebelled. Some of them were so bad, they're in prison. The abusas, the abyss that we see in chapter 9. Most of them are not. So let's talk about the most that are not. Most that are not are angels. They're a third of the angels. They're demons now. But let's talk about all angels. Each of the angels we read about in God's word has power. Each of them has power, exceeds anything that we can understand as a human, as possible by the laws of the physical world. So every angel is off the chart. That's why the Lord said, and that's why Paul said, don't worship angels. People are given to worshiping angels. In fact, there's even all these people that like to keep their little angels around and they buy them, you know, at precious moments and all that. Don't get into that. You're, you, all of that, especially the cultic part and the gaming part, is very dangerous. But why? Because God is absolutely all-powerfully greater than everything. So when you go into angelology, it's, a, it's easy to get kind of fearful. But God says, don't be fearful. But he said, I want you to know the real aliens that, that swirl around us. And God explains them. And by the way, if, if, if they can make humans think that they're aliens from some other civilization that are bringing new technology, they've accomplished their, their feat. Their only goal angels have is, fallen angels, demons, is to distract people from the truth. And if they can distract them with drugs, they do it. If they can do it with immorality, they do it. The bigger thing they do is false religion. They do it. And now, with the endless distractions of electronica, the demons are very active there, getting people away from the truth. And if they can get a Christian to be more interested in, in science fiction or in entertainment or anything else than God, then they've accomplished their purpose to distract us. Angels are supernatural and super powerful creatures. As far as we know, angelic creatures are indestructible. You ever think about that? They can't be killed. You can't destroy them. Now, Frank Peretti wrote, you know, all of his books, and uh, the angels would blow up and stuff, but as far as we know, they can't be killed or destroyed. They can be in prison. They travel the universe effortlessly. They don't, have, they don't need spaceships. They seemingly never rest or sleep. 
And there's only one verse that implies that they even need to eat. In the Psalms, it talks about angels' food. That, and we don't know uh, if that implies that they eat something. But we do know that they're not self-sustaining. Why? Because only God is self-sufficient. Everything else needs to be fed, to be repowered, to be... See, only God is self-contained, self-sufficient, uh, eternal, infinite, you know, uh, needing no plug-in. Angels are only kept alive by the power of God. Demons are only kept alive by the power of God. We are, remember, life's breath we talked about last hour, you know, God holds our life's breath. He's the one that keeps us alive. In him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17 says. But what are the angels? Well, we know of at least five orders of the good angels. The angels I'm calling good, the bad ones I'm calling demons. Both are angels, they're good and bad angels. Lucifer was the guardian. He was the number one top. Highest? How do we know he's so powerful? Because Michael, the, the head of the armies of the Lord, when Michael came near Satan at the burial of the body of Moses, do you know what Jude tells us? I'm sure you know what Jude tells us. I'll read it to you. It says, Now even Michael, the archangel, verse 9 of Jude 1, who contended with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said the Lord rebuke you. The highest good angel doesn't tangle with Satan. He backs up and says, the Lord take care of you. That's the highest of all the good angels. Satan is the most powerful most brilliant, the most greatest creature God ever made. And he fell. Someone asked me about, uh, you know, one of the perennial questions is, where did evil come from? Uh, remember, I was a youth pastor, so I'm not going to get into the philosophical, you know, the, what the great minds have pondered. But let me show you something. God alone is self-sufficient. Everyone else needs help to continue. Here's the greatest creature God ever made. Satan is a purple pen, or Lucifer was. Now notice why the pen is standing up. I'm holding it. Everything in the universe needs holding. Watch what happens when I stop holding. Whoop. I tried to hold it up, but you can't. And what, what evil is, is when God takes his finger off. Nothing can keep up. It all goes downhill. The scriptures put it this way, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Those who never choose to let God hold them up just get further and further fallen from him. How did Satan fall? God temporarily took away the holding, and boom, he fell. That's what you read about. And if we were doing Isaiah 14, when I teach Isaiah, we go all through that in Ezekiel 28. But Lucifer was the guardian. He's called the covering cherub. Uh, actually, I think of him as like any of you that are photographers, you know those big parabolic reflectors that you boof the light in and it diffuses it so you get a good picture, you know, for the uh, portrait mode or whatever. Satan was like a his wings because, you know, he's he's was called the anointed covering cherub. He kind of was like a big reflector hood over the throne of God, reflecting the glory of God back on God. And he was up there with all that glory. And it says in Isaiah and Ezekiel, he thought in his heart, this is really nice. And one of the greatest proofs of inspiration is, he doesn't say in Isaiah or Ezekiel, I'm going to be greater than God because he knows he's a created thing. No one in their right mind knows they could be greater than God, what did he say? I will become like him. And he started absorbing that glory. And that's the essence of pride. When we want to be like God, not in surrender to him, but kind of like, well, look at the spelling. L-U-C-I-F-E-R. Now spell pride. P-R-I-D-E. Then look at sin. S 
I. You know what's the center of everything? I. And that's what happened with Lucifer and he fell, but he still was number one. The cherubim are next. Uh, Lucifer was the highest cherubim, so we know what he looks like. I already told you that, you know, four faces and covered with eyes. Then we have the archangels, like Michael and Gabriel. There are two that are mentioned. Then we have the seraphim. That's actually just a Hebrew word that means the burning ones. They're constantly burning. And they almost, in Isaiah, look interchangeable with the cherubim. But then we have all the normal angels, and there are lots of them. But on the bad side, there are at least seven orders of bad. There are probably seven of the good ones. They just, you know, God is not telling us everything. He's only telling us what we need to know. There's the angel of light. That's the worst one. That's Satan. Then we're going to meet in just a moment the number one general of Satan is called the destroyer. His name is Abaddon or Apollyon. That's why I tell young people, the gamers, I say, I wouldn't play a game that has the name of the very worst of all the demons out there that's down in a pit somewhere that God lets out from time to time because I wouldn't want to attract his attention. Of course, I wouldn't play anything. God says don't have anything to do with demons, so I wouldn't anyway, but I would especially avoid a bad and Apollyon destroyer games. Then there are the horrible monsters of the destroyer that come out that, that we just saw. Then there are the doomed angels that, that not only are in the abyss, they have chains on them. Peter talks about them. They are, it says they're in everlasting chains under darkness awaiting the judgments of the last day. They are so malignant. They're the ones that cause the whole earth to get flooded and they cause so much problem at the time of Noah that God just chained them up and they're waiting for hell. Then we have in chapter 10 of Daniel, the nation princes, the prince of Persia. Did you know Iran, that's the ancient name of Iran is Persia. Did you know that Iran has its own demon that's in charge? Uh, oh, there's another uh, movie, The Prince of Persia. That's a movie, you know, and it's all about the occult too. And so all of this stuff, truth seeps into, you know, all of the media. And of course, they, they distort it a little bit. But there's the Prince of Greece. There's the Prince of Persia. There are all these princes. That, that are demons that control nations. Then Paul introduces a whole sixth category when he's talking about spiritual warfare. He says, Prince Valley's powers, rulers of darkness this age, spiritual hosts of wickedness. We don't know if that's one kind of angel or many kinds of angels. And then there are just plain demons that Jesus is bumping into everywhere. So at least seven groups. 